Well, good afternoon. Well, for you, it's still morning in in morning. Canada. Uh, Gerda, it's really nice seeing you again. Um, we've unfortunately lost you for South Africa, but I think maybe as the start of the conversation, give us a two-minute overview of your career as an industrial engineer, uh, first year in South Africa, and now the opportunities that um, that you've been given abroad as well. You were in the final year class of 2008, so that's already also 12 years ago. Uh, feels like yesterday. Um, <laughs> it doesn't. Um, so 2009, I started my career in uh, for Exaro at Grote Geluk Mine in Alice Ras. Uh, I started as an industrial engineer in the business improvement department. And the big focus there was um, having a look at the production uh, KPIs, uh, performance, and then having a look at, you know, the operational improvements that we can do, helping with the capital projects and so forth. I was in that role for four years. And then I got um, the opportunity or uh, that they employed me as a senior industrial engineer. And within Exaro, that meant um, lots of simulation modelings, mostly mostly simulation modeling um, for operational projects, as well as um, capital projects, greenfields uh, and brownfields uh, projects. And then in 2017, we immigrated to Canada and I had a short stint in Montreal at a software startup company. And the purpose of uh, of the company was to uh, create simulation software specifically for the oil and gas industry. And then I got an opportunity to come to Hatch in Toronto. Um, and now I'm here employed as a simulation specialist. Um, and I build simulation models for iron and steel, mining, railways, ports, um, Within the, um, what's nice about Hatch is it's uh, worldwide. The projects are worldwide. Were you so that's, aware? That's why I'm now. Were, were you aware of Hatch when you were still back here in South Africa? I was aware of them in terms of they were consultant, um, and sometimes uh, they would were, uh, give um, do consulting work for Exaro. But um, no, I, I wasn't working for with Hatch um, in South Africa. Oh, okay. So simulation has played a big role in your career. Was it by choice? Is it something that kind of you decided on? Or was it circumstance and opportunities that just opened up for you in your career? No, it was definitely by choice. So um, in my third year, I was very inspired by Professor Krier. Um, there at the University of Pretoria, I was really, I really enjoyed um, simulation. Um, and I could see, I, I was, I was working as a pharmacist assistant during my uh, while I was studying, and I could really see how simulation can help, you know, in in all areas. So since I was studying, um, I was passionate about simulation modeling, and it was a bit of a it was difficult. It was a bit of a fight, you know, to get that space. Um, for Exaro, for example, they had a big drive that. Simulation is only done at head office. It's only done at head office. And I kind of had to fight for that role and I needed to show them, you know, this could be so great if the simulation guy could be here with the operations. So it was, it was a bit of a fight and it was a, um, and I'm glad I did it because I was passionate about it in the beginning. Um, and so, yeah, so even, but now I'm very specialized. So if you have a look at the careers on LinkedIn, you know, there's, Lots of lots of other jobs for industrial engineers that has have a bigger scope, but because I'm very very specialised, there's there's not a lot of opportunities. But I I enjoy it, and that's the way I would like. That's the way I choose it. Cool. Now, <clears throat> when do you think simulation is the right tool, and when do you think one should actually avoid simulation? So so what's the value of simulation? The value for, uh, for me, well, I can give you the, the textbook answer, is that you can have accurate and practical and realistic predictions of the future, or you can quantify specific benefits of a project. Um, it takes a holistic approach. 
Um, but for me, I, I thought about it this morning while I was driving. What's what's the value that I find? And it gives me, you know, goosebumps when I think about it is when you create the model and then you start working with the client or the manager or the engineer or the designer that had the system, that ha that knows the system. And now you've kind of copied what he knows. And you can give him the tool to push his system to the limits. And he can or she can really see, you know, that they they identify, yes, that's that's where I have my problems. And then you can help them because as a as a simulation model, once you've created the model, you also have a good idea. And as an industrial engineer, you kind of understand systems and where the buffer should be and where the fat should be and where it shouldn't be. So you can kind of lead them. And for me, that's the value. Getting that that spark in their eyes when they see this tool is number one, representing what I know, and um, it copies the frustrations, and then taking that, that tool and showing them, well, but what we can do if you have a little bit more capital, or if you've got a little bit more time, let's rather build in some fat here and we take away. So, so that for me is the value, is, is working with the guys that know their system and getting that, that feedback from them in terms of how can we improve this or get the most benefits out of it. Um, and where I would, sorry. No, carry on. And where I would, what for me is um, sometimes frustrating where I would stay away from simulation is if people want an optimal answer. If they want to know what is the specific amount of trucks I need, simulation for me gives a range of answers and it depends on the system so we can tell you at most you need 40 trucks for example but that's not always the optimal that you need so at some stages those trucks are going to be standing um sometimes they're going to be queuing so um optimal is a difficult is a difficult answer in simulation and clients don't always understand the difference I, I, I agree. I think optimization is, is what we call a prescriptive model. It prescribes what the optimal solution is, while simulation is only as good as the scenario that you actually present exactly. to it. it. It is a predictive model at the end of the day. Okay. Yes. The, well, I often say that, that the best piece of software is the one that you know best. Um, so, I mean, you've been exposed to probably a number of different uh, simulation tools over your over your career. To what to what extent do you think the tool itself is the answer in terms of gives you a better or a worse scenario to work with? Um, and to what extent is it actually your your capability as a model builder? What's the limiting factor? Um, between the software as an enabling tool and you, the model model builder that that is ultimately responsible to build this digital twin of reality. Yeah, well, for me, it's definitely the model builder. You can't, you know, you can have the best software, but it it comes down to you know uh, what you can get out of this software. Um, up to a point. If, if all developers, given all developers are the same, there I would say at one stage you should really also consider what's the software. So, yes, it's mostly what you as a developer uh, bring to the table. But I've seen and I've been frustrated many times about um, – people or simulation modelers or industrial engineers that have gotten stuck into a software and just would not would not change. And if you are one man and it's uh, you are a single company, then it's fine. But once you get into a bigger team um, and, you know, new technologies come in, it's I would definitely say, you know, be open to the fact that you would, as a simulation modeler have to learn new software 
over your career. You it, and it's a it's a learning it's a learning curve, and you have to take time and realize. Well, I can't bill all of this to my clients. I need to go back to the drawing room and ensure that whatever I can do in Arena, I now need to do in Simeo. And then, if the if the up and coming thing is any logic, I don't know. You know, you have to train yourself for that as well. Um, so if all given that all developers have this are the same, I would definitely say um, try and get to new software because I've seen I've seen you can do things much quicker and easier in the newer or the latest software. And I've been frustrated with people that stick to the old way because that's what they know and everybody knows that. Um, but if all software was the same, or, or even even if we're not, if we know we work with different softwares, it's what you as a developer bring to the table. Right. And, and I guess yeah. that that comes with experience. It's partly art, partly science. It's not. Um, it, it's something that you have to you have to get your hands dirty and make a couple of mistakes yourself. Yes, yes, yes. Many cry and, and nights that you cry, or I, I, I don't necessarily cry, but I'll go to bed very very irritated and i'm struggling and then i think just before i get to my REM sleep it's as if <laughs> the solution pops up and then i need to i keep a notebook next to my bed because i'm not the type that stand up and go and fix it but i kind of write down what i think and more often than not the solution just came to me at three in the morning <laughs> What skills do you would you recommend that young industrial engineers should hone further? Um, are there things that, that are in the curriculum that we don't really appreciate or emphasize enough? Or are there additional skills that you think or that you wish you had um, when you were actually studying? So in terms of the curriculum, I think it was honed on in the curriculum, but I didn't necessarily understand the gravity of that was um, the uh, understanding the input data, the statistics, and what goes behind that. So for me, it is in the curriculum. I would just have, um, I would have liked if somebody told me, you know, really focus on that. If you want to go into simulation modeling, input uh, garbage in is garbage out. And you really need to understand what that input means. So statistics really is I would say in terms of the curriculum, something that's not in the curriculum, and I don't think um, classes can actually capture that, is stakeholder management and building those relationships with clients um, on the one hand um, and the guys that give you the information. Now that I'm a consultant, it's a bit different because the guys that give you the information are the clients as well. But when I was on the mine uh, at, at Zorro, that was really nice in terms of my the colleagues in the other departments. They were the, um, the sources of information. And making sure you build those correct relationships. Because once you break the trust of somebody, it's difficult to get that back. So being humble and being open to their opinions, they know their system. Um, working with your clients. So that's why I'm, I call it stakeholder management because it's not just the clients, but really building relationships is something, and I don't think curric curriculum can ad address that. It's something that you learn on the, from the get-go. But um, when you get into your career, but if you burn your fingers with people, it's, it's going to take years to rebuild that relationship. So rather... <laughs> so rather get it right from the beginning and make sure that that you that you have that right relationship and um, with all the stakeholders of the project. Great stuff. Yeah, and I, I think once you've lost credibility, it's it's close to game over. Exactly. Yes, and I've seen it, and it's sad, and so that's that's something I would really and even I, I try to tell, teach that to my kids because I, I don't think it's necessarily uh, in industrial engineering. I think it's lifelong, but I can really see how that um, helps or doesn't help 
in my day-to-day -day work. I'm, I'm curious, maybe just as, as, as a last question, you recently, um, you were a registered professional engineer here in South Africa. Um, and now in Canada, you've also uh, registered as a professional engineer. I think they call it something slightly different over there. But number one, your degree was accredited, so that gives you the opportunity to register as a professional engineer. But why register as a professional engineer? Is it is it compulsory? Um, what was your well, your motivation? In South Africa, it, it's not compulsory. It's just something I always wanted to do. I've um, I, I was raised, you know, you need to get a profession. You know, that's it. You're not just going to uh, um, university. You need to get a profession. So that was the way I, I, I've always wanted to register. And then when I um, came to Canada, uh, you're actually not allowed to call yourself an engineer if you're not registered. So in Canada, it's much, much more regulated. And I just felt there's no way <laughs> that I studied so hard and did all that work and registered in South Africa and did not uh, register here. So there were uh, two additional exams that I had to write, only ethics and law, but everybody needs to write that. It's not, um, and they actually did go through my degree. So subject by subject, I needed to send that in and they vetted that. And um, I've heard of many people that needed to write one or two subjects over, but with me, with my University of Pretoria degree, I was good to go. And uh, I just needed to write the report, very similar to the report that I did for South Africa. So I actually did use much the same reports, South Africa, changed the uh, the wording a bit. And yeah, so luckily I got it earlier this year. Great stuff. Congratulations. Thanks. <laughs> it's really nice having you uh, to chat with. And thank you so much for, for number one, making the time available, but also your involvement still as external examiner here at the University of Pretoria. It's much appreciated. Thanks, Johan. Thank you for giving me the opportunity. I feel very, uh, very humbled and uh, I appreciate it. <laughs> Good. Thank you. Great seeing you again.